the old covenant. We've been doing a teaching called Faith Cometh 20 Ways. Faith Cometh 20 Ways. Now, I, I was not taught this by man, but the Holy Spirit back in 2008 dropped the revelation of faith inside of my heart in over 40 different major areas with up to 20 points, 28 points in some of them. And I began to write as the Holy Ghost led me, and the Spirit of God spoke to me here this month to begin to declare some of these truths. We cannot emphasize or overemphasize the importance of faith. He that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. I, I believe what happened in the garden, there was two trees. There was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. I believe that they were both symbolic. I believe the tree of life is symbolic of faith, trust in God, complete dependence, reliance, upon God, looking to God, uh, walking with God. Enoch walked with God and was not because before his translation he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith it is impossible to please him for he that cometh to God must believe that he is and he is a reward of them that diligently seek him. I'm totally convinced that Enoch was walking in a realm of faith and that's why he was not. I believe that Adam and his wife before they committed sin, they were living in that realm of faith. But when they committed sin, they entered into another world. You might say it's almost like a twilight world. You might say it's like an outer limit. It's like a nightmare. And that's called the realm of unbelief. Now, when you live in the realm of unbelief, the flesh is more real to you than anything. But when you live in the realm of faith, Christ is more real to you than anything. When you live in the realm of unbelief, then financial lack, sickness, disease, poverty, pain, sorrow, sickness, disease... Uh, uh, you know, enemies, adversaries, fear, it overcomes you. Sin overcomes you. Disobedience overcomes you. But when you're living in the realm of faith, you have victory. You're more than a conqueror. You overcome. And this is victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. And so it is a spiritual battle. And it tells us there in Ephesians that it says, for we do not wrestle flesh and blood but against principalities, powers, rules, the darkness, the spiritual weakness in high places. And it says, take unto you the whole armor of God. And one of them is, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able, you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Now, Joseph, you can start that clock if you want to. But you will overcome all the fiery darts of the wicked one by the shield of faith. It's also called the breastplate of faith in another set of scriptures. But we need to have faith. The just shall live by faith. The just shall walk by faith. In Hebrews 11, it tells us that all of those events, there was 50 events with many different characters. You know, whether it be Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Uh, Moses, Joseph, it'd be Joshua, Caleb, it'd be Gideon, Barak, Jephthah, it'd be, it'd be Samuel, it'd be Rahab the harlot, it'd be Esther, it'd be Ruth, it'd be, uh, it'd be Naomi. All of them overcame by faith. Every single one of them overcame by faith. We overcome by faith in Christ. Our confidence in Christ, the weapons are our warfare, not carnal, but mighty through God. To the pulling down of strongholds, that's faith in God taken. And of course, faith is always built and based upon the reality of the word. And faith is the word of God quickened to your heart to where the word of God is more real to you than anything. And so the heart of a believer, this is the realm we live in. We live in the realm of the word. This is where we live. This is what we live out of. This is, this is our reality. You know, today people are really caught up into some of these virtual reality games. And that becomes a reality. Some people are caught up in movies. That becomes a reality. Some people are caught up in sports. That's the realities. This is the reality of the believer, the word of God. Heaven and earth shall pass away, Jesus said, but my word will not pass away. So if faith is, and I don't want to use the word if because it's absolutely necessary. Over and over and over, Jesus said, your faith has made you whole. Over and over, your faith. Let it be done to you according to your faith. And what he was saying is, your trust in me has made me whole. That's what he was saying when he said to blind Bartimaeus, when he said to the woman with the issue of blood, when he said to this Phoenician woman, the Canaanite woman, he said, your trust in me, your trust in God has made you whole. So what gives us the victory? Our trust in God. Well, when man committed sin, a spirit of unbelief, I said it's a spirit 
a bond belief that brings death, that brings fear, that brings anxiety, that brings sickness, that brings disease, that brings immorality, that brings hate and murder and corruption. A spirit of unbelief, not trusting God, not believing God, not depending upon God, not looking to God, not relying on God, where God is our all in all. A spirit of unbelief came in. And it brought death. That's how the thief comes. The thief comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. How does he do it? By unbelief. And what the devil has got to do is he's got to get our eyes off of God, the eyes of our heart, our motive. Remember, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all of thy heart, with all of thy soul, with all of thy mind, with all thy strength, and all thy being. Now, right away, I tell you, I can show you there's a voice of unbelief in every human being. I believe it's the voice of the devil because the minute that we hear the first commandment, love God with everything, there's a little voice inside of us that says, impossible. No way. God could not expect you to love him with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, and all of your strength. There ain't no way. That's the voice of the devil. What do you do with that? You take the shield of faith, and you take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, slap him with the shield and cut off his silly head. You go for it by faith. But now we need faith. I mean, matter of fact, the disciples said, increase our faith. They knew they need faith. And so in order to do the will of God, I need to have faith because without faith, I can't do the will of God. Well, faith comes 20 ways. And so we're going to look at number 11. The 11th way that faith will come. And you can watch the rest of the teaching. We do have the DVDs and we have the CDs available. But we also have it archived up on the YouTube channels. But if you look here, and we're going to take a look here in 2 Chronicles chapter 5. In verse 1, Solomon has just dedicated and he has just built the temple to the Lord. Uh, the temple that David wanted to build, but he wasn't allowed to because of the blood that was on his hand because he was a man of war. And in verse 12, he assigns 120 priests to sound the trumpets. Isn't that amazing? 120 priests, when we know that in the book of Acts, it talks about 120 people. So there's 120 Levites, and they're blowing the trumpets in verse 13. And it, and it came even to pass as the trumpets and singers were as one to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking Lord. And when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music and praise the Lord. Now listen to this. Saying, for God is good for his mercy. Say mercy. mercy. Now this is a very, very important word within the scriptures. Mercy is very important in a believer's life. See, mercy is, mercy is very important. See, that's one of the major aspects of God's nature, his character, his disposition. God is a God of mercy. And it literally talks more about mercy almost than any other subject in the Old Covenant. And matter of fact, do you remember when God had Moses build the the Ark of the Covenant in the wilderness, and they made the tabernacle, they made the Holy of Holies, and they had what they call the Ark of the Covenant and had a lid, and it was made of acacia wood, or, you, or, or it, King James says shittim wood, acacia wood, and it was overlaid with gold, and it was called the mercy seat. And it sat right there where God himself sits. God sits upon the mercy seat. That was all symbolic of heaven. And so they would bring the blood of the lamb in, sprinkle it upon the mercy seat. And when Christ died and rose again, he took his blood to the heavenly mercy seat, the mercy seat, and he sprinkled it upon that, that golden lid. Well, where, where the Ark of the Covenant, where the manna was and, and the rod of Aaron that budded and the Ten Commandments, that was where the blood was shed on the mercy seat. And so they began to cry out. They began to cry out. The mercy of the Lord endureth forever. Something happened when they did that. When they began to cry out to God's mercy, listen, that then the house was filled with the cloud. That's called the glory. Say the glory. Even the house of the Lord. The, when they began to cry out, the mercy of the Lord endureth forever. That means his loving kindness, his compassion, his forgiveness. Now, this is what we would call unmerited forgiveness. 
It's redemption. It's the atonement, the mercy of God. See, you and I don't deserve heaven. We deserve hell. We all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. No human being deserves. Do you know everything that God does for you is an act of his mercy? It's an act of his mercy. You don't deserve any good thing from God. So when you get healed, when you get your prayers answered, when your sins are forgiven, everything that happens is an act of God's mercy. So when they began to acknowledge God's mercy, and I'm going to be teaching some important aspects of mercy because the 11th way that faith will come is when you begin to cry out and apprehend the mercy of God. I cannot tell you how many times when I knew in my heart I was not really operating in faith. The only thing I had faith in, listen to me, the only thing I seemed to be able to have faith in was God's mercy. <laughs> That's all I could. I, I, didn't, I didn't seem to have faith for anything else. Just, oh, God, you're a merciful God. You're a forgiving God. You're a loving God. And so, God, give me mercy. Give me mercy. Give me mercy, God. I need mercy. And guess what happens? The glory cloud came. And then it says, so that the priest could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud of God's glory. So this cloud, we would call it the Shekinah. And it says, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. Now I have personally seen the glory cloud numerous times in my life. I have seen the glory cloud. I remember one time I was up in Alaska. I had just been saved for about a year. I had been ministering to the Yupik Indians. And it was during the winter time, and I, I, I wanted to get to a church. I couldn't get, I couldn't, I didn't have transportation, so I had a hitchhike. It was like 20, 30 below outside in Anchorage, and I'm thumbing my way as a 20 year old man to a church, and it's still there. You can look it up. It's called Abbott Loop Fellowship. Very large church, and they were really, really, they really had an amazing worship and praise. They were really into really crying out to God. And I remember I come into the service late. And so I, I come into one of the back seats, and it's kind of like built up like, like a movie theater. So I'm kind of up here, I'm looking down, and they're singing this wonderful song to the Lord. And I just began to pour out my heart to God. I'm pouring out my heart to God. My eyes are closed, and all of a sudden I began to smell a fragrance, right? I began to smell a fragrance. I opened up my eyes, and it was like the whole room was filled with nothing but a glistening, bright, sparkling fog. I couldn't even, it wasn't my imagination, the whole room. Now, see, the amazing thing is with God's glory is you might see it and nobody else will. See, when you're in that realm of faith, you begin to see things that no, somehow I had tapped into the realm of faith. Now, listen, when I saw the glory cloud, all of a sudden, my faith exploded in my heart. I went, Oh, I'm lost in this glory cloud. I couldn't even see the people hardly in front of me. The whole place, I guess it could have sat a thousand people in that church. It was filled with the glory. I was just whelmed. I don't know if anybody else saw it. So tonight as I'm preaching, you might, you might see some of the glory cloud. You might see an angel. You might see Jesus. I don't know what you're going to see. But I'll tell you what, as I began to worship God, well, that happened to me one other time. Uh, it was literally about, a, 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 about maybe six months before that. I was driving my sister's Maverick uh, up to Alaska. And as I was going up the Elkan Freeway, what happened is, the, is, is the, the, the roads got washed out. It was the flood season. It was in the spring of 1975. Probably, well, maybe right around, I got out probably, I don't know, June or July. But it was flooding. I had to turn around, and as I'm coming back out of the mountains of Canada, and I'm coming down into, I think it's called the province of Susquehanna. I'm not sure if that was, or, or I can't remember the name. I'm not pronouncing it right, but I'm just worshiping God. I'm just praising God. I'm just thanking God, and my heart is filled with gratitude, and, dude, and tears are rolling down my face, and I just sense something happening, and next thing you know, the car, inside of the car, that glory cloud began to come. The Shekinah glory began to come. 
And all of a sudden, I, I couldn't even look out the windshield. I, I was just so lost, I took my hands off of the steering wheels. And you know, liars go to hell, I'm not lying to you. So I had my hands lifted up, and I'm lost in the Holy Ghost. I'm totally gone, man. I am so filled with God's glory. I am gone. You better make sure you're full of God's glory before you do this. And I'm telling you, it felt like I was there forever. And after a while, my hands came down. And all of a sudden, the glory cloud dissipated and the sun was setting. And when that first happened, the sun was way up in the middle of the sky. So someone drove that car, I think, for over two hours. Who was driving that car? <laughs> could have been an angel, could have been the Holy Ghost, could have been Jesus. I don't know. But the glory cloud came in. But notice as they were worshiping and saying, the mercy of the Lord endure forever. The glory cloud came and nobody could stand up. And they said, oh, I don't know about people falling under the power. That's the glory cloud. That's the Shekinah. That's the presence of God coming in. Well, look there in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 1. We might as well just hang around here for a little bit. Chapter 7, verse 1. Now, when Solomon had made an end of praying, the fire came down from heaven. Whoa, he got done praying, and now fire is falling like on the day of Pentecost. I mean, they were all in one accord, and they were praying, and the fire fell. You all get ready for the fire to fall? Yeah. And it says, and consume the burnt offering and the sacrifice and the glory. Here it is again. The Shekinah, the cloud of God, filled the house. Once again, here comes the glory. Oh, once again. And the priest, in verse 2, the priest could not enter into the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. Hallelujah. Woo! Huh. And when all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down and the glory of the Lord upon the house, listen what they did. This is, this is what happened. They bowed themselves with their faces to the ground upon the pavement and worshiped and praised the Lord saying this for he is good for his mercy endureth forever so you know what they did they connected the glory cloud the Shekinah the presence of God with his mercy and let me ask you something if you would have been in a meeting like this do you think faith might have came rushing in yeah. wouldn't faith explode in your heart I said the mercy of the Lord, the mercy of the Lord. And all of a sudden, here comes the glory. You go, whoa, hallelujah, I can trust God. And you'd be moving in a realm of faith you'd never moved before. When you apprehend God's mercy, faith comes rushing in. See, if you get to thinking you deserve God's blessings, God, and I know there's promises, no good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly and, and, and them that delight in the law of the Lord, they're going to be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. And, and I, I know there's, there's promises and, and, and draw nigh to God and he'll draw nigh to you. I understand these things, but, but it all comes from God's mercy. It's God's mercy, isn't it? So as you apprehend God's mercy, have you ever apprehended God's mercy and it just, sometimes when you apprehend God's mercy, I remember one time I was driving a motorcycle through the, through the mountains of Oregon and it was early in the morning. I had just packed up my sleeping bags and stuff. I was about not quite 21 yet and, and, and I'm headed back up to Alaska, but I'm going out to Oregon. I'm coming around and here's this big old mule deer, way bigger than a Pennsylvania deer. I mean, the mule deers are big. They're almost like, like antelope. This big old mule deer, he came jumping out of the woods right next to my right hand off of a bank. He was headed right towards me. He was going to collide in me. It was going to be nothing but a collision of blood, guts, and steering bars, and human flesh with mixed... I mean, they couldn't have separated us. He was going to slam right into me. I said, Jesus! And I'm telling you, something supernatural picked up that big old mule deer. I was looking right at his chest. And something picked up that mule deer, picked him right up over the top of me. I could see an angel was there. And they said, oh, don't worry, Mike, we'll take care of you, Mikey. And they picked him up. Don't you call me Mikey, but we'll help you, Mikey. Picked up that mule deer and put it right over my head, and he took off on the other side. Now, I'm telling you, that deer was right there. He was picked up, put over me, hit the other bank, and took off a running. That was the mercy of God. 
I'm telling you, I got so full of God's joy. I was so full of God's mercy. My hands came off the steering bars. I'm driving down the road on my motorcycle without my hands on the steering bars. Say, oh, Jesus. And then my hands came back down. I don't know how long that happened, but I was just so full of, of love for God. The mercy of the Lord endureth forever, and faith begins to come as you begin to apprehend the mercy of God. Look there in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. Huh, you want to look a little bit more here? See, it's the mercy of the Lord. Now, in chapter 20, Jehoshaphat's the king, and what's happening is the children of Moab and the children of Amen, besides other Ammonites, they've all gotten together as a great big humongous army, and they're going to come against and wipe out, they're going to wipe out the children of Judah and Benjamin because Jehoshaphat is over, you know, because the kingdom's been divided now. you got the ten tribes under Israel. you got the other two tribes underneath the descendants of Solomon. And so Jehoshaphat knows that they're undone. And verse 6, he begins to cry out to God and says, O Lord God of our fathers, art not thou God in the heaven, and rulest thou not over all the kingdoms of the heathen? And in thine hand is there not power? And he begins to cry out to God. And as he's crying out to God, there's a prophet that comes forth. And this prophet begins to speak by the Spirit of God in verse 20. He says, believe. And this is what the prophet says. Believe in the Lord your God. Do what? Believe. Now this is in, in chapter 20, verse 20 of Second Chronicles. Chapter 20, verse 20. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall you be established. Believe his prophets, so shall you prosper. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed singers unto the Lord that should praise the beauty of holiness. And as they went out before the army to say, Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, for his mercy endureth forever. His mercy endureth forever. Now listen, as they were singing, as they were apprehending, as they were acknowledging, as they were praising God for his mercy. Lord, we just praise you for your mercy right now. We thank you for your mercy, your loving kindness, and your compassion. Thank you for having mercy on our wretched souls. And as he began to cry out, God began to praise God for his mercy in verse 22. And when they began to sing and to acknowledge God's mercy and to praise, the Lord set ambushments against the children of Amen, Moab, and Mount Seir, which were come against Judah, and they were smitten. Woo! Glory! Hallelujah! God showed up when they began to cry out for mercy. The church needs to begin to cry out, God have mercy on us, Lord, in this wretched generation, this wicked government, this wicked society. Oh, God have mercy on us. See, people are not taking into account who God is. You dare not meditate on the enemy. You dare not meditate on Goliath. You dare not meditate on the Moabites and the Ammonites and the Amorites and all the other ites. You got to cry out to God for mercy. And as you cry out to God for mercy, faith will begin to come. See, you understand, God sits upon his mercy seat. That's where the blood of Jesus was poured. And it says that in the time of need, what do we do? Come boldly before the throne of grace that you may obtain mercy. Say, I need mercy, Lord. Mercy. That you may obtain mercy and grace to help you. Oh, God, I need mercy. You know, I think, I think, I think about, I think about, the man on the cross, the thief who was hung there with Jesus. And they were both mocking Christ, but all of a sudden, when, when he saw Jesus say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You understand, mercy is apprehended by those who receive God's forgiveness, and they give forgiveness. Amen. See, do you understand, if you don't give mercy, you won't receive mercy. It says, be as your Father in heaven. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall, huh, they shall partake of mercy. So you got to have mercy on people. you got to forgive them. And it says, given it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over shall men give into your bosom. That's talking about relationships. And so if I give mercy, I'll get mercy back. If I give forgiveness, I'll get forgiveness back. 
And so it's very important, and we're going to see that in a little bit in the New Testament, but as I forgive, I will be forgiven. See, I just choose to forgive. God, I forgive. That's giving people mercy. Lord, I forgive them. You know, there's many times that I have rented people or people owed me money more times than I can count. I don't keep track of it. But I'm telling you right now that literally through the years, I have forgiven thousands and thousands and thousands, even the network. Before we, when we had our satellite network, we, we had people that owed us money and I never took them to court. I never sent them threatening letters. I never said, you better pay this. I just simply forgave them right now there's people who have been with us they owe us money I know they're never going to pay us you know what I've done in my heart I just forgive them give and it shall be given unto you forgive and you shall be given you got to show mercy to get mercy mercy rejoices against judgment mercy rejoices against judgment and that brings faith when I forgive when I forgive, when I choose, Father, you said, that's just, this is one way that faith comes. We taught it by simply doing what the word says. The word says, lift your hands, you lift your hands. The word says, dance, you dance. The word says, shout, you. Was that a shout? Yeah. The word says, go to church, you go to church. Right? The, the, the word says, do, be good, do good. You do it. You just do it. And it comes. When you show mercy, faith will come. See, David was a man filled with mercy. Solomon was a man filled with mercy. And Jehoshaphat, when they began to sing and praise the Lord, the Lord set up ambushments for the children of Ammon and Moab. Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir. Utterly, listen, they turned on each other to slay and destroy. And when they had made an end to the inhabitants of Seir, every one helped to destroy another. Now that's crazy. They had this big old argument. And you had the Moabites and the Ammonites and the Ammons and all the rest of them. They got mad at each other and they began to kill each other. And they're helping each other kill each other. And when they got done killing those of the opposite tribes, then they turned on each other. They slaughtered each other. It says, take heed lest you devour one another. Bitterness, resentment, anger. You'll devour people in your own family. When you don't have mercy, love covers a multitude of sin. And that's unbelief, isn't it? Yeah. All bitterness, all hate, all resentment, all anger. You know, Jehoshaphat didn't kill these, hate these people. They just wanted to be free. I don't hate people. I just, you know, I had a man one time, oh, God help him, and he did repent. But he was one of our teachers in our school, and he kind of led a rebellion against the pastor. And, 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 and before you know it, all the teachers were just so mad and angry at me. The gossip was just so out of control. It was like a house on fire. And I, I was trying to put the fires out spiritually, and finally school got over. It was so bad, I just shut the school down. I mean, it was so vicious. And you know what I did? I forgave that man. I prayed for the man. Next thing I heard, the man got an incurable disease. Incurable. I heard I was praying for him. He had been a good pastor at one time, but he had just gotten bitter at me, got mad at me over some Mickey Mouse stupid stuff. That's what the devil always does. We got to be careful lest a root of bitterness spring up in any of us. Next thing I know, I get a phone call one day. He's on the phone. His wife is holding the phone next to his ear, and he said, Brother Mike. I ain't called him by name. I said, Oh, brother, what's going on? Oh, brother. He said, I'm dying. But before I died, I had to ask you, Please, please forgive me. I start crying over the phone. I said, brother, I forgive you. I forgive you. I said, I forgive you. Oh, thank you. I said, you can go in peace now. Oh, thank you, brother. He got off the phone and he died that day. But see, he opened the door for the devil because of bitterness, because of resentment, because of, of, of this root of not giving mercy. See, so when you, won't, when you give mercy, when you just choose to forgive people, even if they are completely in the wrong and you are completely innocent, faith will come flooding into your soul. But man, when you get bitter, you know the Bible says bitterness will dry the marrow out of your bones. As a matter of fact, it'll give you arthritis, it'll give you cancer, it'll give you ulcers. You got to forgive, you got to have mercy. Aren't you glad that God's merciful with us? And it says, and when Judah, verse 24, I like this. And when Judah came towards the watchtower in the wilderness, they looked onto the multitude, and behold, there were dead bodies fallen to the earth, and none escaped. Wow, none of them. 
And when Jehoshaphat and his people came to take with the spoil of them, they found among them in abundance both riches with the dead bodies and precious jewels, which they stripped off for themselves more than they could carry away. And they were three days in gathering of the spoil. It was so much. Can you say praise the Lord? Now I'm not rejoicing over the dead adversary. I just can't understand how could they be so stupid to bring all their expensive jewelry into the war. They must have been showing it off. Let me show you my Rolex. Let me show you my, my 10 carat diamond. Let me show you my crown of uh, my, my, my bracelets. Let me show you my, my, my $10,000 alligator shoes. I don't know. But it was all there because they were singing the mercy of the Lord endure forever. You know, as I was going through every story that was in the, new, in, in the four Gospels where people were crying out, actually ten times in the Gospels, blind Bartimaeus crying out, Oh, Lord, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. Have mercy. That's all he cried. They told him, shut up, shut up. But he had a hold of the reality. He knew he didn't deserve healing. He knew he didn't deserve anything from God. He just said, Oh, mercy, mercy, mercy. Finally, Jesus said, Okay, he stopped, bring that man to me. He said, what do you want? He said that I, I might have my eyes opened up. Listen, I tell you, I cannot tell you how many times I cried out for mercy for God. I know I was telling you some years ago, my son Daniel got rabies from a rabid raccoon. And it's my fault because I let him have the raccoon. And, and they basically told us he has rabies, he's going to die. He was running a high fever. He was delirious. He was laying in bed. He was only about 16 years old. He said, Dad, I'm dying. I'm dying. I can't get right with God. And I went down into my little front room and I grabbed the ashes out of the wood stove and I dumped them all over me and I laid on my face all night weeping and wailing and all I could do was say, Mercy God! Mercy for my son Daniel! Mercy for the people in the church that got around. They said they're going to have to get shots including a pregnant woman and oh God have mercy! And all night I cried out for mercy. I mean all night and early in the morning it was like the sun shined through the roof of the ceiling of that room and joy flooded my soul and faith had come to me crying out for mercy faith came to me as I cried out for mercy and all of a sudden I had joy and I had peace and because that's where, where mercy lives there'll be peace and there'll be joy and there'll be rest and all of a sudden and grace will come and faith came into my heart I stood up and I knew and I knew, I knew my son was healed. I knew the rabies was gone. And I had asked God, remove the rabies from the raccoon. For they don't put everybody through these shots. And it was so strange because they knew this raccoon was so infected. They said they'd get back in touch with me right away because they'd have to begin the shots. But it took like three days. They finally called me back and said, we don't know what's going on, Reverend. We know that raccoon had rabies. We knew that something was majorly wrong. But when we got done with all of the tests... We could not find no rabies. Hallelujah. See, that was God's mercy. That was God's mercy. I was crying out for mercy. I wasn't boldly confessing the word. I wasn't walking the floor and saying in the name of Jesus, I bind you, devil, you spirit, you spirit of, uh, 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 of rabies, you spirit of death. Come out of my boy. Come out of this church. Come out. I'm not saying that couldn't have happened, but I didn't have faith for that. All I had faith in was God's mercy. <laughs> I probably operate more in that realm than anyway. Oh, mercy. Sometimes I've been driving and I begin to lose control of the car. I know when I was coming back with that bus and it was this sheer ice out and we saw trucks laying in the ditch at women's conference and the ladies didn't know it. They were getting drunk in the spirit and laughing and shouting and the wind was blowing and I'd feel the whole bus begin to lose it. I'd begin to go, whoa, that's it, Jesus. And my heart was saying, mercy. And all of a sudden, something would grab that bus and straighten it right back up. But that bus was gone over and over. It's like, oh, we're gone, we're gone. Jesus, and his mercy would kick in. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad when God's mercy Mercy kicks in. Oh, I'm so glad when God's mercy kicks in. Mercy. And so, blind Bartimaeus, mercy. And then there was a woman, a Canaanite woman, that had a daughter who was demon-possessed. And Jesus said, it's not fit to give the, the, the bread to the, to the dogs. And she said, but Lord, even the little puppies eat the crumbs off their master's floor. And he said, oh, your faith is great. But she was saying, mercy. She didn't have nothing else to depend upon. She wasn't a covenant partaker. She didn't have a right to the bread of the children. She said, mercy. Cry out, mercy. mercy. Oh, whatever you're in, trust God for mercy. 
Judas didn't have to hang himself. Judas could have repented and said, oh, God, have mercy. You know what? I've been crying out to America. I have been crying, oh, God, America deserves another revival. America deserves a move of God. I have not been crying that out. I've been saying, oh, Lord, have mercy on America. Have mercy on America. Have mercy on my families. You know what? There's been many times when I saw people I loved and I knew and I knew they were, and, I, and they, they, they themselves wouldn't repent, but I cried out for mercy for them. I said, oh, Lord, have mercy so and so. Oh, Lord, let them come through this operation. Oh, Lord, let to and turn around. And I watched God have mercy on them. But faith came, comes as you begin to cry out to God's mercy. And so there was tw twice, it's not the same incident in Matthew, there was two blind men crying out, mercy, 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 and it got the attention of Jesus. Let me tell you something, if you got the attention of Jesus, you got the attention of the Father. I'm telling you, when you cry out from the sincerity of your heart and you have repented from what you have done, even Ahab, the wicked king, whose wife's name was Jezebel, who was a witch, he got into trouble, he was dying, and the prophet Elijah came in and said, Ahab, you better get your house in order because you're a dead man. And Ahab turned his face to the wall. Hezekiah did this. And he cried out, Oh, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, have mercy on me. And before Elijah got out of the palace, God said, go back and tell him I'm going to give him 15 more years because he cried out for mercy. <laughs> the ten lepers. They cried out for mercy. And God, and Jesus says, hey, go show yourself to the priest and do what's required of you. And as they went, the leprosy was gone. Cry out for mercy, people. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Have mercy on our home. Have mercy in our families. Have mercy on us. Oh, God, we need mercy. I mean, as you're driving down the road, say, Lord, have mercy on my little Sammy. Have mercy on my little Julie. Have mercy on my little Bob. Have mercy on my, Rick, my husband. Have mercy, oh God. Don't let it, don't. I know, I know, I know they deserve to die. I know they deserve death. I know they deserve hell. Oh, but God, have mercy. Faith will come to you. Faith will come to you. The mercy seat, the mercy seat is where God sits. That's where God sits. That's where the blood was poured. That's what we need. We need the mercy of God. Say, I need the mercy of God. Oh, God, we need your mercy. If there is ever a generation that needed your mercy, it's today. Look in Psalms 100, please. I'm just going to read some scriptures here real quick, if that's okay with you. Psalms 100, verse 4 and 5. Listen to this. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. That's another way that faith comes, the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. Say everlasting mercy. <laughs> we will live forever in his everlasting mercy. It says, and his truth endure to all generations. Now, see, David knew something. This is the Psalm of David. See, David based, I believe he based his victory on the Philistines, on Goliath, on the lion, on the bear. I believe that David uh, acknowledged his kingship was all based on the mercy of God. It wasn't based on his spirituality. It wasn't based on his intellect. It was based on the mercy of God. And the New Testament says that, we, that, that our salvation is literally because of the mercy of God. Did you know that? That our salvation, our redemption, our atonement, there's many scriptures, let's look them up. We ain't got time tonight. I'm already, already almost out of time. And it's all based on God's mercy. You know, I know some people are calling it God's unconditional love, but what they don't understand... It's really not unconditional to the extent that you repent. See, you, see, people who don't repent, they don't get mercy. What they experience is God's goodness, God's kindness, and God's long-suffering. Everybody experiences that. How many times when you were a sinner, you should have died, and you didn't repent, but you didn't die? I'm telling you, there's stuff I did, crazy stuff as a sinner, and I didn't die. That wasn't God's mercy. See, people get things confused. 
That was God's goodness, kindness, and long-suffering. But see, mercy is much greater than just God's goodness and kindness and long-suffering. It says, do not err, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights in whom there's no vermin, it's not or shadow of turning, of his own will. Say, of his own will. Begot he us with the word of truth that we should be a kind of his first creatures. That's the mercy of God. And you that and you had the quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. It says we have become partakers of his nature by the mercies of God. By the mercies of God. So look there in 105 verse 1, please. 105 verse 1. I mean, this is amazing. 105 verse 1. Uh, is that where it's at? Oh, I thought it was. Hold on. Hold on. Oh, it's 106 verse 1. It says, I praise you, the Lord. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, and his mercy endureth forever. 107, verse 1. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Uh, Psalms 118. I'm going to read that. Psalms 118, verse 1. Look, look, look at what it says here. It says, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord. For he is good, because his mercy endureth forever. Let Israel now say that his mercy endureth forever. Let the house of Aaron now say that his mercy endureth forever. Let them that now that fear the Lord say that his mercy endureth forever. Let them at Jesus' his Lord ministry say his mercy endureth forever. forever. It's in there, ain't it? Let his people say, his mercy endureth forever. In the very last verse, listen how he finishes it in verse 29. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. forever. Let's just give you one more example of Psalms 136. Oh, now this is 26 verses. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Now, when you get a chance, this is your homework. 26 times. 26 times he says, the mercy, the mercy, the mercy, the mercy, the mercy, the mercy of the Lord endureth forever. And every, every time they sang, the mercy of the Lord endureth forever, faith came flooding into their souls. See, because they knew that all the great mighty deeds that were connected with their, uh, with their history from Noah all the way up to that time was because of God's mercy. I, I mean, the, the manna they were fed with, the shoes that wear out, there was not one feeble among their tribe, the water from the rock, the fire by night, the cloud by day, it was all God's mercy. When the glory of the Lord came, it was all because of God's mercy. Say, all of my redemption, of my redemption. is because of God's mercy. Now, let's go a little bit deeper. Go to Matthew chapter 18, please. Apprehend the mercy of God. Apprehend the mercy of God. You know what's amazing? This is, this is, this is so pivotal. Do you know, no matter how wicked a man is, no matter what you have done wrong, if you will in your heart say, God, I am so sorry Please have mercy on me. God will show up. <laughs> God will show up. There's something amazing about that word and its significance. There's something mystical. There's something powerful about God. Have mercy on me, O oh Lord. I need your mercy, Father. And you got to be for real. And God will show up. God will show up. I'm convinced when we get to heaven, you'll find out many believers as they share their testimonies. Uh, they were in predicaments where they knew it was their fault that it was because of their stupidity. It was because of their ungodliness. It was because of, of, of their wrong priorities. But when they said, mercy, mercy, oh God, God showed up. That's how faith comes. Faith will come. I said faith will come if you'll cry out mercy. mercy. Faith will come and you believe it. Mercy. Do you believe he'll have mercy in your poor souls? <laughs> I believe he has mercy on us here at Jesus' Lord. 
Don't you dare for one moment and say, oh, praise God, that Pastor Mike's got awesome faith. What are you nuts? It's not my awesome faith. It's his mercy. <laughs> it's his mercy the electric is still on. It's his mercy that they haven't sold our facility for taxes past due. It's his mercy that on and on and on and on that the sewage bill is paid and so forth and so on. It's his mercy. Mercy comes. Mercy comes as you cry. I tell you, faith will come as you cry out for God's mercy. <laughs> See, remember, listen, there is two men, they went to the synagogue, or they went to the temple. One man was a very dedicated, on fire, committed priest. He said, Lord, I, I tithe on all my mint and all my spices. I mean, even on the spices. When they'd go out here and get a pound of pepper, they'd give 10% of it to God. And they'd get, they, they tithe on everything. And then we prayed, we fasted, we did this, we did that. And he's there and he says, Lord, I'm glad I'm not like this publican. You know, publican were considered dirt because they were collecting taxes for the Romans and that was illegal. But here this publican is, he's beating his chest, he's weeping, he's well, he's crying. He said, oh God. I know I'm wretched. I know I'm, I'm immoral. I know I'm lost, oh God. Will you please, oh God, have mercy on my poor, wretched soul? And you know what Jesus said? Which one of them went away justified and forgiven? The man who cried out, Lord, have mercy on me. <laughs> Woo! Thank God for his mercy. Don't you feel the faith come and see that bubbling, that excitement, that joy in your heart? That's faith rising up inside of you. That's God depositing faith because you're in the throne of grace. You're at the seat of mercy where the blood of Christ was, was spilled. Mm. Verse 23 of chapter 18 of Matthew. Therefore it is the kingdom of heaven like therefore is the kingdom of heaven like unto a certain king which would take account of his servants, and when he had begun to reckon one was brought unto him which owed him ten thousand talents. I mean they say that was a lot of money, man. That's a whole hunk of money. But for as much he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, his wife, children, and all that he had, and payment to be made. But the servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, be patient with me, and I will pay you all. For which I'm going to make it right. Just give me some time. Verse 27, then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion. That's what mercy is, is God being moved with compassion for you. <laughs> Say, God, be moved with compassion for my poor, wretched soul. And loosed him and forgave him the debt. Now, that stinker went out and found a man that owed him about $15. He went out in verse 32. In verse 32, see, the king found out he grabbed the guy by the throat and threw him in prison for 15 lousy dollars. And it says, O oh, thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desirest me. Notice how mercy works. It works this way. God, please forgive me. Have mercy on me. God said, okay, you asked for it, I'll give it to you. Well, isn't that amazing? Amen. You can't buy mercy. You can't pray mercy. You can't work for mercy. You simply say, oh God, have mercy on my soul. But here's the thing. You got to have mercy on others. You got to forgive or you won't be forgiven. You know, I put that up on Facebook today. What, what it's called uh, OSAS, once saved, always saved. And I said, well, okay, if OSAS is correct, then what do you do with what Jesus said? If you don't forgive, neither will my Father forgive you in heaven. Can an unforgiven man go to heaven? No. You got to forgive or God won't have mercy on you. Now, did you notice this is so, and, and I, I'm not really, I'm trying to teach about how faith comes. Faith comes as you cry out for mercy, but you got to give mercy. But here's the thing. This is what's frightening. If you won't forgive, then all of those sins you have been forgiven of are no longer forgiven. This man's debt, when he refused, remember, the king forgave him all that debt. Did he not? Ten thousand talents he was forgiven well it's a done deal he goes out and finds a man that owes him 15 bucks right grabs him by the throat throws him in prison 
The king said, this is the kingdom of heaven. The king has them drugged before him, throw, puts them in chains, throws them in the outer darkness, and he says, all, and if you go, look what it says here in verse 33. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. The 10,000 talents that he'd been forgiven of, they were all put back on him. See, I, I, I discovered this as a baby Christian. I grew up in a home. My, dad was, my daddy, he was so bitter. That bitterness got at me. He, he was so bitter at people, so angry at people, so hateful. It got into me. I mean, it was in me. I was a hateful, spiteful little man. I mean, whoa, you did me wrong. You were, you were dirt and mud in my book, and you better watch out, because if I could get back at you, I would. But you know what? When I got born again and I experienced the mercy of God, the forgiveness of God, I said, oh, Father, if you could, if you for, could, could forgive this wretched man those 10,000 talents, then I can forgive any kind of little flea-bitten thing somebody's done to me. Praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. And faith came flooding into my soul as I forgave by the grace of God. Listen, verse 35. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you. Every sin you've ever committed, if you don't forgive, it will come right back on you. Every single one. That's why it's incredible that anybody in the body of Christ is bitter. Because don't they know? Every stinking sin you've ever committed will be put right back on you. And you'll not get out till you pay for it. Or how many know you can't pay for it? Only the blood of Christ can cleanse it. If you from your hearts forgive not everyone his brother, their trespasses. You know, it's amazing when we pray the, uh, uh, go to Mark 11 as we get ready to close here. As we uh, pray, our, our Father which art in heaven, how be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Have mercy as you give mercy. Thank God as you cry out for mercy. Mercy! Faith will come. Faith will come. God, have mercy on me. Now, first thing you got to do is you got to make sure that you forgive everybody. You just got to forgive them. Now, listen, I understand if you own a business and people owe you money. I'm not saying you shouldn't expect to get paid i'm not saying and and i'm not going to tell you because it says don't take a brother to court i understand so i'm not saying i, I, I that's you know but you don't have to be bitter you don't have to be angry you don't have to be hateful you don't have to be spiteful i have renters i've got to charge them i charge them so cheap compared to anybody else and I know without a shadow of a doubt, they got the money. They're just spending the money on cigarettes or on booze or on movies or on other stupid stuff. I know they've got money. I know they do. I watch them. And, and, and so I, I'm not bitter at them, but I say, hey, you got to pay up. Now, I, I don't take them to court. Never have. I've had renters who owed me literally uh, one time a truck driver who got really seriously hurt. He lied to me. He says, oh, the insurance claim is coming any time. The insurance claim is coming any time. And it went on and on and on. He owed me well over 1000 bucks. And one day I came in and he was gone. And one of the guys told me, he said, oh, Pastor Mike, he was lying to you. I said, what? He, 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 it was his fault. He never had an insurance claim. He was just living off of you. You know what I did? I didn't lose one ounce of sleep. Not one minute of sleep. I said, well, Lord, I, I just give it to you. Why? Because I'd have been in hell. If I got what I deserved, I would have been in hell for the last 37, 38 years. Thank God I'm not in hell. Hallelujah. Pastor Mike, what if they take everything away from you, but they can't take my soul? Praise the Lord. See, the early church, they had to be operating in mercy because they were being betrayed. They were being beheaded. They were being, and, and we've had Christians who were burned at the stakes. They were thrown in prison. They were fed to the lions. They, 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 were, they were lied about and, and beat up, and they never got bitter. Why? Because they knew the mercy of God. They said, just do your worst because, you know what, don't fear him that can destroy the body, but rather fear him which can destroy both soul and body in hell. Amen. 
Well, look what it says here in Mark 11. We're going to get ready to close here, but Mark 11, 22. They saw the fig tri dried up. Jesus had cursed it the day before. In verse 11, when he said, no, eat, no man eat fruit of thee from hereafter. And Jesus said this, have faith in God. Say it's important to have faith in God. See, faith in Christ is the true, authentic faith. It is a substance. All other faiths is just psychological hogwash. Listen to me. When they say, I have faith in Muhammad, I have faith in Allah, I have faith in Buddha, I have faith in Hare Krishna, that is not faith. That is just a belief system. That is just a vain thought. That is a false god. But faith in Christ is a spiritual substance. It is a spiritual substance that creates and holds all things together. Okay? It says, have faith in God, for verily I say unto you, now this is how faith works, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed, and be thou cast in his seat, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he has said shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Now listen, let's, listen and, and I'm not really touching, I'm not really trying to teach you how faith works tonight, but I like to throw this stuff in there. Remember, we began having faith in God. Okay, so if you have faith in God that whatever you say is going to come to pass, I guarantee most things you're not really believing is going to come to pass because you really don't want them to come to pass. Oh, my back is killing me. You'd fall down dead. You're not really believing Thank God what you're saying is you're not having faith. God, I have faith in you. When I say this, it's going to happen. No, you don't have faith in that. You don't have faith in God that will happen. I hope you don't. Otherwise, I'll be doing your funeral. So what are you having faith in? You're having faith that the things you say that are the will of the Father will happen. I believe this facility will be filled to overflowing with hungry people for Jesus. Y'all believe that? Look what it says there in verse 24. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever ye desire, when you pray, believe that you receive, and you shall have them. Now can I tell you, listen to me. You never heard it this way, most likely, but you know what he was referring to? He was talking about them wanting mercy. I can prove it to you. He cursed the fig tree that didn't have any fruit. They saw the fig tree dead, dried up from the roots. And they said, Jesus! And they had heard him teach about not having fruit. They had heard him tell the parable about the man who owned a vineyard. And that the, the owner of the vineyard said to the caretaker, cut down the tree, it has no fruit. Hold on here, it has no fruit. Cut down the fig tree, it has no fruit. He says, let me have another year. Then they see Jesus walking along. He sees a beautiful fig tree with green leaves, goes up, there's no figs. They hear him. No man eat fruit from thee hereafter. Turns away. They come the next day. The fig tree is not just dead. It is withered up. It is ugly and nasty. And they go, oh, Lord, Lord, you cursed that fig tree and it withered up. Oh, they were amazed. And they're thinking, whoa, if Jesus gets upset with me, I'm a dead man. Yes. So I can prove to you. So whatsoever things you desire. Remember, what do I want? I want mercy, God. Mercy. Oh, pastor, how can you say that? Look at the next verse. Therefore I say unto you, whatsoever things you desire, when you play, believe that you receive, you shall have. And when you stand praying, do what? Forgive. Forgive. <laughs> He said, listen, if I'm going to give you mercy, then you've got to have mercy. He's teaching them about faith. If you're going to operate in faith, you've got to have mercy, people. You've got to be moved with compassion. This thing is not a self-centered me-ism prayer. This is having mercy. Oh, God, have mercy on me. Have mercy on them. Have mercy on us, oh, God. And when you stand praying, forgive. 
If you have aught against any, why? That your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. For he shall have judgment without mercy that has showed no mercy. And mercy rejoices against judgment. The context of Mark 11, 23, 24 is talking about having mercy. <laughs> having mercy, man. Having mercy. How does faith come, Pastor Mike? Well, when you cry out for mercy. You give mercy and you say, Lord, I need mercy. Oh, Lord, I need mercy. Lord, have mercy on this church. Lord, have mercy on this network, Father. You know what we need, Father. Lord, have mercy, Father. Have mercy on this congregation. You know what we're endeavoring to do, Father. We're here for your glory, for your will. Lord, have mercy on those who are watching right now. Lord, have mercy on those right now watching. Lord, have mercy on those who have arthritis, those who have ruptured disc, those who have kidneys that are failing, those who have livers that are diseased, those who have clogged arteries, those who have heart disease. Lord, those who are alcoholics or drug addicts. Lord, those who are hooked on pornography, those who are filled with anger and hate. Oh God, I cry out for them. I say, have mercy on them, God. Have mercy on them. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. How does faith come? Number 11, when you cry out, have mercy, God. Have mercy and faith will come. The glory will come. The Shekinah will come. The presence of God will come. Amen. Well, you can stop recording. I'm not done yet preaching, but you can stop recording. I, I just want to speak to those who are here and right